Speed welcomes you to Daytona International Speedway for NASCAR Nextel Cup Series practice. A couple of hours of practice for the Cup cars and then a practice for the NASCAR Busch Series on Speed this afternoon. Today, the key word is controversy, one that boiled over Sunday afternoon and has now been reduced to a simmer but still active throughout the garage, and another controversy building, and that is the one about bump drafting. Watch the Hendrick teammates, 5 and 48 here, as Jimmy Johnson gets not one but two bumps going down the back stretch, trying to move him up a little further, a little closer, and then Jimmy drops down and, and out of line there. Now, when that happens in the corner, it is problematic, so says defending Nextel Cup champion, two-time champion Tony Stewart, who was very vocal after the Budweiser shootout Sunday, saying that if this keeps up through the week, there's going to be drastic consequences. Hi, everybody. Mike Joy, Larry McReynolds, and Jeff Hammond with you once again for this practice session. And now it's practice in earnest, practice for the Gatorade 150s and for the Daytona 500. Bump drafting. How big a danger is it? Uh, excuse me, Larry. <laughs> is that a zone that or not a zone? Draft. It's a slam drafting that's the problem. <laughs> Mike, what it really turns into being is right now, the dr drivers themselves understand the danger. The crews understand the dangers. But all of a sudden, it's gotten so out of control to the point that right now they're finally starting to say something themselves. And I think it's really good to see Tony Stewart step up and say we got a problem. Now, he may went a little over the top when he did it, but he at least got everybody's attention. And now NASCAR is making some good decisions, I think, to get to the bottom of this thing and try to put it back in the driver's hands. Not totally, you know, come in and write a rule they didn't need, Larry Mack, but they did realize we got to put some onus back on the drivers. They're the ones that are doing this stuff. So if they will take responsibility in these areas, hey, we might be okay. Yeah, I mean, and Jeff and Mike, bump drafting just did not start. We're going to see it all week here. We're going to see it in the IROC race on Friday. We're going to see it in the Bush Series race on Saturday. And I don't think anyone has had a huge problem with bump drafting. But as you saw in that footage while ago, if you're on a straightaway and the driver's going in a straight line, a driver loves it because it catapults him ahead of the guy he's trying to race beside him. It's where they're turning the car into the corners and down in the corner. Remember, at about 190 miles per hour, that's where the bump drafting has gotten out of control is when the car is not going in a straight line. The other controversy, the one that boiled over Sunday, was with Jimmy Johnson's qualifying run. The car was uh, set de deemed by NASCAR to have an unapproved aerodynamic device. And Chad Knauss has been given at least a vacation through the Daytona 500. He won't be anywhere on the Speedway grounds. Jimmy Johnson, the driver, just held a press conference to address the issue. Dave Burns was there. And Mike, of course, it sounds like he wanted to sort of deflect a little of uh, the criticism early on, or at least tell people where he stood. So he started with a little bit of an opening comment where he used the word damaging in terms of how this affects the Lowe's team. But he also talked about the fact that he was not aware uh, that there was anything with, uh, going on with that particular uh, mechanical change to the car. He says he encourages his crew chief and team to continue working within the gray areas to try to gain a competitive advantage. He's just the driver. But he did say that his role as cheerleader on this team was going to change a little bit because Chad was one of the biggest cheerleaders on this team. He's been ejected for speed weeks. He will not be here on Sunday for the 500. So Jimmy needs to become a little bit more of that. Uh, he also said that he agreed that the penalty was consistent for Chad, as NASCAR has uh, given to other crew chiefs recently, and um, that he really didn't think that the uh, penalty that was incurred here tainted the 48 team or that past penalties on Chad Knauss have tainted this 48 team. He says, you know what? It's a black cloud at times, and it's unfortunate, especially at the biggest race of the year here, but he really doesn't feel like that. He had lunch with Chad yesterday. They went over their game plan, and now a young man named Darian Grubb will assume the crew chief duties for Sunday's Daytona 500 in place of Chad Knauss. The final question to Jimmy, can you still win? Guess what he said. Obvious. Of course we can. Now, Mike. Darren is the uh, team engineer, so he moves up into the crew chief role. That's fairly common among NASCAR teams when a crew chief is excused or suspended for an event. Jimmy's car passed pre-qualifying inspection, but in post-qualifying inspection, it was determined that the rear window area had been modified in such a way to keep air from reaching the rear spoiler. And I think later on in the show, maybe we don't, don't have so much going on on the racetrack, we'll get you a shot and we'll explain what exactly went on right there. Well, right now, guys, you look at Jimmy Johnson, and, and I think that it, I admire him for stepping up and saying, look, I'm going to put this team on my shoulders and get it done. And Dave, it, it looks to me like uh, he's wanting to share some more of his thoughts with us. Well, you know, uh, we talked about it earlier, and of course he went to the media center so that we didn't have to do this interview, but 
He was kind of playing around here and said, sure, you know, I'll answer another question. I guess most everything uh, I just sort of share with there, the main point being that um, without Chad, you guys still have a good shot at the Daytona 500. Oh, without a doubt. Uh, listen to the things there in the media center felt that, you know, I needed to get up and say some comments on the team's behalf. And these guys are ready. I mean, they're working hard. They had to make quite a few changes because we didn't have a chance to get the car switched over from qualifying trim um, after qualifying with everything that took place. So the guys are working great, taking their time. We'll get out this morning in the first practice, have some fun, and, and work on the car for the 500. And you've also heard some new things coming down from NASCAR in terms of bump drafting will be monitored by NASCAR officials here. How do you feel about that? Is it something that they're going to be able to officiate well, um, given the fact that they're kind of leaving it in your hands? Yeah, it's going to be tough. Um, you know, they, they're going to, I just talked to Helton, and they're going to put some people in the corners to keep an eye on things. And, and the thing I'm excited to see is they, they know that bump drafting is a problem. Um, bump, bump slamming or slam, slam drafting. Yeah, that, whatever it's been, been quoted as. Uh, they don't mind bump drafting. And the other big key is, is the side drafting, and there's been some wrecks caused from that. So they're going to keep an eye on, on bump drafting and side drafting. And if somebody, you know, looks like they're making some crazy moves, then they're going to send them down pit road for, uh, you know, stop and go. Or maybe if it's a pass from them, I'm not exactly sure what it is. But, um, you know, they've got to do something. And after the big statements made by, by Tony, I think they're, they're trying to make some, uh, you know, some changes in that effect. It sounds like the 150s are going to be a great test bed for the NASCAR, for NASCAR to be officiating that, as well as you guys maybe to change your driving style. Yeah, and I really think what you saw in the shootout was a lot of excitement, a lot of guys racing for a trophy. I don't think you'll see that level of excitement until you get to the end of the 500. The duels will be calm. Um, you get to the shootout, it, it's going to, I'm sorry, you get to the 500, it's going to be relatively relaxed. Another good example is if you look at the All-Star event at Lowe's Motor Speedway, the All-Star All -Star event is out of control, but you get to the 600 and it's just a regular race. So uh, the pressure was on the other end. Everybody wanted to win the race and it showed and everybody's driving. All right, thanks for your time. We'll let Jimmy get to work here with his crew and his uh, new crew chief for the weekend, Jeremy Grubb. Well, with that said, boys, bump drafting's behind us. Rear windows is behind us. Now it's time to roll our sleeves up, Jeff, and get down to business. We've got to get these cars driving good. We've got two practice sessions before those Gatorade Dual 150s tomorrow. Did you see, as Jimmy was talking, the ease with which the 31 of Jeff Burton shot right to the front on the inside a couple laps ago here? I'm with you, partner. That's what I was paying attention to. That bright orange number 31 came roaring up through there, cut his way through traffic, caught up with Dale Jarrett and said, Hey, Dale, watch this. Went to the outside, and now he's up for leading this pack. He's got himself a strong hot rod right now. Jeff Burton sitting on the pole for the Daytona 500, looking pretty strong early part of practice. And he will lead that first dual race tomorrow. He will start on the pole for that race. Jeff Gordon, who sat on the outside of the front row, will be on the pole for the second dual race. Taylor Earnhardt Jr., quickest in the early laps. Up next, Hell Cup practice, Matt Kenseth, Ryan Newman have the fast times in the early going. NASCAR Live coming up next here on Speed as our wall-to-wall -wall coverage from the World Center of Racing continues in Speed Weeks 2006. Hey guys, we've, we've got 58 cars here trying to qualify for the Daytona 500. Uh, they do not let everyone out there at one time. There will actually be 29 cars in each Gatorade 150. NASCAR lets about 25 cars at a time out there in a pack just to keep from having too big of a pack of cars. Yeah, in the past we've seen where the packs get so big on the racetrack that NASCAR is forced to throw a caution to get back control of the field because they didn't want to see everybody out there. So they make a mistake and wind up taking a large quantity of cars. I notice them. at the back of this pack right here, you'll see the red car, the Budweiser car, Dale Earnhardt Jr., and the 8, Kevin Harvick, and the 29. I've got a sneaky feeling they have an agenda right here in this practice. They started at the back of this pack, and they are notorious to see if they can work their way through this pack. That will tell them how good their car drives in all different configurations and if they can make it to the front indeed. When we went to commercial, Harvick was at the front of this pack, but he drifted all the way back to find Earnhardt, and now here he goes, passing the 8. And trying to move up. In the irony of Dale Earnhardt Jr. in eight car, this is what he'll have to do tomorrow because he will start 20th in that first dual race. So he's going to be at the back of the pack when that race starts tomorrow. And let's join Matt Yoakum. Hey, Mike, when you look at today's practice session, a lot of decisions were actually made back in January when you talked to Greg Biffle. He had a big decision to make, whether to pick the Bud Shootout car, which he ended up running on Sunday, or this very race car. He felt this car, although a 10th, 
to a tenth and a half slower by itself was a much, a much better feeling race car as far as comfort and feel. He felt this one was in the racetrack more, and he knows handling at Daytona, always important, even though drafting and how your car works with the air is important, but how it handles. He's hoping during this practice session to get a good feel because the twin 150s on Thursday, handling will be key. He says that's the big agenda for this session. Like Larry Max said, you shake off the rust and you start working towards Sunday. Dave? And Matt just checking in on the Ryan Newman car, which has uh, pulled its way onto uh, its garage stall here. Ryan reporting the car really drew up to the other car as well, got in that draft and could really draw up to the cars he was following. Was just a little bit loose on the track, so they're going to drop the track bar on both sides of the car, just about an inch, according to crew chief Matt Borland, and hopefully that will get this car to uh, just be a little bit tighter, a little more comfortable for Ryan in traffic. Mike? What you're hearing is all about feel, and what Greg Biffle said was echoed by several of the Roush racing drivers, particularly there's Mark Martin right center of your screen in the six, working there with Jeff Burton, a former teammate at Roush Racing, and with Greg Biffle in the 16. Give me the car that feels the best. It doesn't have to be the fastest, and I'll get it there. Well, you got to be able to get a car, and every driver that's in this race or practicing for this race will tell you. You want to win the Daytona 500, you've got to be able to hold the car wide open during the entire run. And that means when you drop the green flag and with the small fuel cells going 35 laps, you want to be able to do that and be able to run wide open right now. And what I was just noticing, Sterling Marlin in the 14 car, did you see him way at the beginning of the back straightaway? He was given that hand signal. This is something the drivers, they've got to get back to as well. This could keep something from happening like what happened to Carl Edwards on that green flag stop in the Budweiser shootout, knowing that that driver's waving that hand saying, hey, I'm going to pit road. I'm pitting the next lap. But yeah, what these guys are trying to accomplish here, the, the dual 150 race is 60 laps. As Jeff reference they have the smaller fuel cell they can go about 35 laps on fuel so what these guys want to do now knowing they're going to have to make a pit stop i would say a lot of these cars would love to make about a 30 or 35 lap run here knowing that's a full run on four tires and fuel and jeff what i saw sunday in the budweiser shootout you better put four tires on when you hit pit road what you need to do, my friend, is tape that thumb down to where those four fingers are always exposed <laughs> if you're a crew chief because you're going to need four good years every time you come down pit road if you want to do any good. Earnhardt Jr., Kenseth, and Newman are quickest, followed by Kevin LePage and Scott Wimmer. Log on to speedtv.com for custom wallpaper and ringtones for your cell phone from Speed Mobile. Log on now and download your favorite ringtone and wallpaper today. Is that yours, Jeff, the luck nuts? That's mine, Mike. Yeah, I mean, okay. I come up with that one. I thought you'd appreciate it. That's good. Jeff keeps us guessing with his ringtones. He changes it pretty regularly. practice speed so far two of them are drivers that have to race their way into the day 2500 kevin lepage and scott wimmer are among those 19 drivers for whom only four spots are available in the gatorade duel and what we mean by that we, we as i mentioned earlier 58 cars here checked in to qualify for the daytona 500 we come down here knowing that the top 35 and owner points from last year, that they are locked in the show, not necessarily where they start, but they will race the Daytona 500. We also come down here knowing that the most recent champion that's not in the top 35, which is Terry Labonte, we'll talk about his situation as well, he's locked into the Daytona 500. So in qualifying Sunday, the fastest three speeds that is not of the top 35, which is Bill Elliott, Travis Quapple, and Hermie Sadler, they are now locked into the show. So now, of the remaining cars, as you mentioned, 19 cars, they're searching to be one of those top two finishers in those Gatorade dual races that's not part of the top 35. Now, Larry, you mentioned Hermie Sadler. I was with Hermie last night talking about his situation. He's locked into the Daytona 500. I said, how does it feel to be in the situation you're in? He said, well, Jeff, a year ago, I couldn't sleep because I was trying and worrying so much about how I was going to get into the Daytona 500. I couldn't sleep. Now, this time... I'm in the Daytona 500, and I'm so excited about being there, I still can't sleep. So it's like, but it's a good kind. He is just so excited that he and the Aaron's Dream Machine, and this new race team he has made the Daytona 500. There are a couple of wild cards, like the car in the center of your screen, 36, Bill Elliott. Elliott is guaranteed in on speed. 
He's guaranteed in if Terry Labonte races his way in. He'd be the next eligible for past champions, but now he won't need it. But he could improve his starting spot by racing his way in and finishing in one of those two spots. And if Elliott races into the show on Thursday, then the next car on speed would move up into the field from time trial speed. Which is Robbie Gordon, the seven car, who missed being one of the fastest three by four one-hundredths of a second. Remember, he was the man last year that finished seventh in the dual race and missed the Daytona 500. There is Robbie Gordon in the Jim Beam Chevrolet. So close to making the show, but he's got his work cut out for him Thursday. Sunday, live from Daytona, the all-new NASCAR race day, built by the Home Depot. The only pre-race show that gives you inside secrets, expert access, and a whole lot of adrenaline. Get set for the Daytona 500 with NASCAR race day right here on Speed, Sunday morning, 11 a.m. Here's Matt with the fastest man in this practice. Also, the host of his own show on Speed back in the day, Dale Earnhardt Jr. First off, is that a lot of fun for you? Uh, it is, especially to see the finished product. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people did a lot of hard work to, uh, to make that thing happen in just a shorter period of time as it did. But uh, really proud of it. We've got great reviews. And uh, got to thank Speed and everybody for, uh, for helping me put it together. Talk about your bud crew here. They're working feverishly on the front. Were you bottoming out, Junior? No, we were. The uh, car was great, really fast. Just a lot of guys coming on the track trying to get into the lead draft, and it sort of gets a lot of three wide things going and upsets some people. But uh, so I just kind of laid to the back a little bit and just say how my car was getting run and stuff. We've got a real good car. Tony Jr. obviously thinks it needs to be better, so he's going to work on it pretty hard. But uh, it's, uh, it's a great piece. Your thoughts on NASCAR's new no fly zone, so to speak? down in the corners uh, with the slam drafting in the corners as we are under caution because the 11 did scrape the wall. But your thoughts on NASCAR's new policy they're throwing up? Um, well, I think that uh, what they need to do is uh, just talk about it more in the driver's meetings. Uh, obviously, they didn't say much about it in the driver's meeting before the shootout. But uh, when those guys talk, we listen. And uh, obviously, get a couple drivers up there like uh, Dale Jarrett and, Ter and uh, Bobby Labonte, a couple guys, veterans that we'll all you know look up to and listen to, to say a few things. A lot of these guys coming in, obviously, are, uh, don't have a lot of experience bump drafting and stuff like that. And it just they just need veterans just to tell them, you know, tell them how it's done and what's what's the etiquette is, you know. It's a lack of respect too. It's not lack of respect, just lack of lack of knowledge of how to, how to effectively do it, you know. So. Uh, yeah, we all are guilty of being too rough, but uh, it's, uh, I think, like I said before, I think the, the 500 and the qualifying races will have a whole different outlook to them than the shootout. The shootout was a sprint, a lot of risks taken. They won't be taken the rest of the week, so uh, I don't see uh, it being an issue. And you can see how pumped up Junior and this entire Bud team is on getting ready for this season. He's predicted six wins this year, Mike. Thanks, Matt. Have a look at the pancaked right side of Denny Hamlin's number 11, the FedEx car, as he trails Brian Vickers coming off four. Jeff, it just looked like that dreaded late exit push that you fight here. Normally, it's worse off turn two. This was coming off turn four, but it just looked, you know, the wheel was not responding to him turning it, and it just gets up in the wall, runs out of racetrack. Yeah, he just got in there, right th you know, drafting up behind Brian Vickers and probably doing a little bit of bumper driving at the same time, and the car got away from him. But I, it didn't look like it was that severe. I believe the crew should be able to affect repairs without a whole lot of problem. Let's check with Dave. Jeff Gordon waiting to go out. You're, you're missing a little track time here, but uh, you know this place pretty well. What's your crew working on? Well, you know, we, we, we've got uh, this practice and next practice all day tomorrow. Um, you know, practice on Friday, Saturday. So we got plenty of practice. There's no rush for us to get out there, especially, uh, you know, learning a little bit from all the butt shootout practice. We got a really good car, and we just want to get out there, check all of our rubs, and just kind of take it slow and then didn't get ourselves into positions that you know we may be in in the race and you know we're going to probably try a little bit more than we would what we normally would for for tomorrow and uh you know see, see how it works out for us i, I guess that, you know what you what you do is obviously you want a good handling car but you want it to be as fast as possible so we might push the limit on the speed a little bit more and see if we can keep the handling in it we know the temperatures are are, are creeping up there 
so handling's going to be more of an issue, but uh, yeah, I'd rather learn on Thursday about that than on Sunday. You had success here, Jeff, before slam draft and became the norm around here. How tough is it going to be for NASCAR to monitor that, or do you think the drivers will do a good enough job that they don't have to lay down the law? Well, that's the thing is that, you know, I think that they were hoping, and, and I'm, I'm really uh, pretty proud of NASCAR for, for finally stepping up, you know, and doing something about, about the bump draft because you can't leave it in the driver's hands. I mean, we've got to, you know, we're all out there racing and adrenaline's flowing, and, and once the teams built these bumpers up good enough to where we could start hitting one another, it just became the norm, and you don't have a choice. You know, you're either getting pushed from behind or you're pushing the guy ahead of you, and the only way to really... You know, the, the, the easier way to make passes was to just knock the heck out of the guy in front of you. But it just started getting a little bit crazy. Guys are doing the trioval, doing the corners. You know, a guy's maybe changing lanes, and then you got somebody hitting them. So, you know, there, there's a way to still tap and, 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 you know, help a guy's momentum without just driving into him from five feet back with uh, 10 miles an hour of, of momentum. So, um, you know, I, I do like the older days when, when, when the pockets of air were, were enough to, to help push the guys around and you use air behind you, you close the air in front of you. You know, uh, I'm, I'm curious to see how they're going to monitor that because, you know, sometimes you're getting pushed from behind and you, you're on the brakes and you're still running the guy ahead of you. So I'm really curious to see how they're going to work all that out. But I am proud of the fact that, you know, they're going to try to, to, to not stop it, but, but at least make some sense out of it. We, and we either got to change the front bumpers and rear bumpers so we can't do that, or they got to they got to make a judgment call from the from the tower. Thanks, Jeff. Mike, there's a lot at stake here, a lot at play in this new way of ruling the bump draft. I'm not surprised that the strategy of the 24 car or the 31 car, they're locked into the front row. They can use tomorrow as a test session. The most frequently asked question, does the front row for the Daytona 500 have to run those qualifying races? They have to start those races, but I know from experience that the two years that I was part of being on the front row, my response to my driver was, if this car's not right, let's park it and we'll get it right for Sunday, one of the most important races of the year. And besides, it pays a little over 50,000 to win. Okay. No change in the Fast Five thus far. You're watching Nextel Cup practice. Valvoline counts you down to the green flag for the Daytona 500 on NBC coming up Sunday. As the Daytona 500 hopefuls are in this and the next practice session. The origins of bump drafting as uh, something that was out and about and talked about in the media go back about 20 years to, believe it or not, the Sports Car Club of America. They invented a professional series for compact pickup trucks, Chevy S10s, Ford Rangers, and since those things, like our NASCAR Craftsman trucks, were pretty much a brick to the wind, the front truck would use up all his horsepower, moving the air out of the way, and teammates found that you could give a guy a shot and propel both of you down the straightaways faster. And it worked real well for a while. And then they didn't call it slam drafting, but essentially that's what happened. And he ended up with trucks scattered all over the place, but that's kind of where it started. Now, that's, uh, these folks here discovered it on their own uh, many years later, but the principle is the same. The car in front is moving all the air. So the car behind, the second car, has all this reserve horsepower that he can't use because there's a car in front of him. So the idea is to propel both of you down the straightaway faster, and that's not a bad thing. The bad thing happens when it starts to happen in the corners when the two cars are not headed in exactly the same direction. But Mike, Jeff Gordon hit the nail on the head, and Jeff and I have been talking about this all week long down here uh, on speed at all of our different shows. Uh, it was not, you know, 10 years ago we would come down here and we'd maybe have a piece of inch and a quarter tubing with a couple of little braces that served as the front bumper behind these noses. I walked through that garage area the other day, and so I won't talk about which car or which crew chief, but there was a brand new race car in that garage area. And just out of curiosity, being an inquiring mind, I said, how much lead do you have in this race car? Now these cars should hold new about three or 350 pounds. He said, I got about 40 pounds in it. I said, 40 pounds? He said, Larry, look at the bars in the nose of this race car. It's a miniature roll cage up there. I know we can't fix it here for speed weeks, but I just believe long-term, looking towards Talladega in a couple of months, NASCAR mandates everything else, mandate the configuration of the bars behind these noses. That will stop it, and they won't have to make a ball strike call. 
So soften up the front of the cars so that if you get into the back of somebody, it does damage to your car. That would be a powerful deterrent. Which is what deterrent. happened for years. It's what happened for years. Guys, we were watching this here a minute ago. I noticed that David Strimmy and his teammate right there, Reed Sorensen. You'll notice the white car with the bulls out on the hood right there down on the bottom side. There's David Strimmy trying to get around him. They just about made contact through the tribal area. I mean, really, really got close. And that would have been bad news if David would have caught him right there on the right rear corner because that would have probably turned Reed. And you see a little smoke off the left front of the 40 car would have turned him up in that outside wall and would have took a lot of race cars out of this pack. This is uh, uh, looking from uh, Dale Jarrett's car after his onboard. He's watching what's going on. He's like, whoa, you hear him jump out of the throttle right there saying, guys, <laughs> this is only this practice. This is just practice. But just you know what's practice. tough about that, Mike and Jeff, is remember, it's mandatory you have a spotter during practice, but that was at a part of the racetrack where the cars are driving away from the spotter, and it's hard to make that judgment call right there as they're going away from you, headed down towards turn one. Looks like, look like the 41 washed up just a little bit there, and just a little bit at these speeds is all it takes. Dave? Hey, Larry Mack, you used to be a crew chief, right? I used to be. Did yeah, the boy? <laughs> it's a loaded question, I can tell. Yeah, let me out of it right now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, does the body shop watch the racing? Oh, I'm yeah. sure I, they do. Yeah, you know they do. And they were watching the Budweiser shootout at Roush Racing on Sunday afternoon when we broadcasted just a little bit late. And they saw that Jamie McMurray had a very fast number 26. They also saw that he dinged up about four corners of it. So they came down. They actually brought three extra body guys down to work on this car because it's going to be the backup car to his Daytona 500 car. And it's happening several times down here on pit lane. The shootout cars are usually the second best. And they're going to fix these up, make them all aero pretty again, and hopefully uh, present them. Hopefully they don't have to use them, but it will be the backup for Jamie. Hey, Dave, yeah. before, oh. before you jump out there, yeah. I just want to tell you, when uh, Larry and I were crew chiefs, we used to have to do that ourselves. We didn't bring extra people down a lot of times. We just would go ahead and do it ourselves as a crew chiefs. We are kind of like a jack of all trades. It wasn't probably as good as what they were doing, but we do it ourselves. But you so, know why? We wanted to fix it better than it was. That's exactly right. <laughs> you didn't trust the body shop. I can't believe it. Matt. And Larry Mack, one of your old bosses, owner Richard Childress, looking very confident. The 31 car on the pole. Now, Jeff Burton says the car is a little tight on exit, not the way he wants to, to have that car feel. So they made a sway bar change. And his teammate, Kevin Harvick, he says the car is much faster than we thought when we first got here and unloaded. So both the 29 and 31 very pleased with how this practice session is going so far. And this is about when that push off the corner that we've been talking about. Jeff Burton has ran 19 laps in this practice session, not 19 laps in a row. But that's getting past a half of a fuel run, half of a run on tires. That's when you start to shove that nose late exit of the corner. We're looking, looking right now it's, uh, outside of Burton's car, looking ahead at the uh, four car Scott Wimmers. It's about 20 degrees warmer than it was when we practiced for qualifying. We'll talk about how that plays out. When we come back, slick. If you look right there on the wall, it's clean and white right now, but watch the 74 car as he comes forward. All of a sudden, he when he passes, he's going to leave his mark. Right here, Derek Coat gets contact with the wall, and bingo, we have another mark, black mark. He did get in that wall just a little bit, guys. Again, Larry, cars pushing that little bit on late exit off these turns. We're going to see a lot more of that before the day's done. I listened to him uh, from inside the 31 car, and you could actually hear him bottom it out as you see the 74 car bounce off that wall off the turn four. And unfortunately, when those things start to push off the corner, the only thing you can do is roll out of the throttle. Now, we promised that we would talk about the infraction on the 48 car Chad Canals. This is the track bar adjuster right there. Now, we, if you want to keep air off the spoiler the thing you want to do is you, if you can get this back window area up here up it's going to take air off the spoiler but nascar had body templates they put on that area of the car that pretty much dictates the configuration of that well what there is there's a collar right here on this track bar that that adjuster goes through and the 48 car had that collar that went down all the way through the firewall and pretty much set on top of the track bar now one of the parts of inspection after the body templates is nascar says you cannot have more than a three inch rake in the track bar on the left rear and the right rear if you go through with less than three inches they will let you raise that track bar up right there when the 48 car got to that station 
they were less than three inches. NASCAR says you can raise your track bar. So as they back that track bar up right there, that adjuster was against the window and it raised this area of the window up, which in turn took air off of the rear spoiler. When the car was sitting on pit road after qualifying, NASCAR noticed the back window did not look exactly right. They put it back through the templates in post qualifying inspection, which they can, and realized then it didn't come close to fitting the templates. That's trouble, when they trouble, started exploring trouble turn why. Four. Trouble in turn four. We got guys getting looser. I think our post sitter just about got in the back of the car, right in the middle of turn four. Sorry about that, Larry. All of a sudden, That's everybody got jammed up. Kyle Petty was the appeared to be the car in trouble there, the 45, the Wells Fargo Dodge. And it kind of jacked yeah. up the field. He there. along with Kenny Wallace right there. I mean, it was, it was close, guys. We come into turn four right there. You'll see the 31 car. There's Dale Jarrett down low. Kyle Petty on the high side. And Kenny Wallace gets loose is what happens. He gets loose, goes right up in front, front and sitter. catches Kyle Petty and turns him to the infield. I mean, really close, guys. And you can see uh, J.J. Yaley in the 18. His teammate Tony Stewart in the 20 stacking up behind them as well. It liked to have been big here in practice. Did you hear that? Whew. Oh, yeah. Watch, to the 41 coming through here. Reed Sorensen never gets out of the gas as uh, all this unfolds. First Wallace, 73. Tips Kyle. Everybody checks up but the 41. And he scoots through, changes lanes, and drives on. But the moral of the story on the 48 car, they were trying to get air off the rear spoiler. They accomplished that. They were caught by NASCAR. How much was it worth on the stopwatch? I don't know. It could have been worth two or three tenths. But the bottom line is their qualifying time was disallowed. And crew chief Chad Knaus, for taking those liberties, is going to spend the Daytona 500 in front of his television set. Who knows, maybe we'll see Chad Knaus on the season premiere of Pinks. Lose the race, lose your ride. Just kidding, Chad, but it's a great show. Uh, fever pitch. Talk about anxiety, high anxiety and adrenaline. Pinks premiere season two, February 22nd. You're on speed. Rained out Saturday night. They ran the Bud Shootout on Sunday early evening and with a little bit of a bump draft from Jimmy Johnson. Denny Hamlin goes into the lead and holds off. Dale Earnhardt Jr. and Tony Stewart to send a rookie to victory lane for the first time in the history of the Budweiser Shootout. Dave? And Mike, uh, with Denny Hamlin now, we just showed some highlights from Sunday's win, but uh, you got kind of a rude little uh, answer from the wall here today. What happened out there, Denny? Uh, she just got behind the 25, and um, it, it just took off. And it, the way these aero packages are, the harder you lift off the gas, the worse it shoves. And uh, I was on the, off the gas on the brake, and it just took off up the racetrack and um, got the right side pretty good. But uh, I think we're going to forego this practice and the next and uh, try to fix this car. In the shootout, did you experience anything like that, or did this take you just way by surprise? No, it tracks a whole lot hotter today. Uh, it tracks a whole lot slicker. So, uh, no, I really didn't expect, especially with that that new tires on it. It really, uh, really shouldn't have done that. But uh, we'll get it fixed. It's uh, you know, it didn't exactly feel right in the wheel. So uh, something something was amiss. But. Um, We'll, uh, we'll get it all straight and uh, go for those duels tomorrow. And as Eddie's saying, they feel right now like the car can be repaired. They won't have to go to their backup car, which, of course, would be the winning car from Sunday, the shootout car. Is this all part of the learning curve for rookie at Daytona? Well, you, you would have to know that, Jeff, the track has not even remotely as much grip as it had Sunday. I'd say the track temperature probably could be 40, 50 degrees warmer uh, than it was. And, and, and it's only going to get worse as the week goes on. It's supposed to get hotter. We're going to have more laps on the racetrack. It's going to continue to lose grip. Yeah, it's kind of like, welcome to Daytona USA. Now the most latest incident. Kenny Wallace getting up into Kyle Petty, who Matt made a really great save. Great save indeed, Mike. And you can see the yellow paint all along the left rear quarter panel of Kyle Petty's car. Now, Greg Stedman has helped beat that back out. And Kyle Petty sits in the race car. Close call there, KP. Yeah, you know, I was on the outside of Kenny, and I guess I just took the wind off his nose. Nothing he could do. There's nothing he could do. And he just jumped up into me turned me and drove me down across the flat. 
Uh, that was my Jimmy Johnson Im imitation <laughs> from what Jimmy did the other day. I thought he did a great save. I'm just hanging on, man. But um, it, it was good. That, hey, that's part of it down here when you're racing or when you're practicing like this. You got to put your car in every situation you can to see how bad the air is and how bad things are. And Kenny was in a bad place, and I ended up being in a bad place, and that's what happens. But we'll get, a, we'll get the Wells Fargo Dodge fix. We'll go back out. Now, being a veteran, you passed along a message to your spotter to pass along to a rookie as constructive criticism to help him out in future situations. Tell me about that. Yeah, yeah. The thing was, you know, obviously I about wrecked, okay? So everybody else checks up, uh, and one of the guys didn't check up a little bit. And look, that's just, that's a learning curve. You got to go through that curve. You got to learn it. You got to know when not to and when to go through. And in practice, practice doesn't count. And racing, that was a perfect move, man. If that had been to 500, he made the move of the day right there. But in practice, it doesn't make any difference. You just roll out and do it. And, that, and that's what I told, told Dale. I said, just tell him, hey, it's constructive criticism. I'm not mad. I'm not, not screaming and, and yelling. I can't do that. You know that. But, uh, you know, it's just a little bit of learn from, from what just happened in front of you. And maybe the next time, everybody will be okay. And his spotter he's talking about is Dale Inman. And the young man he was discussing was Reed Sorensen in the 41. He says, just tell him I'm not mad. I'm not slamming him. It's just constructive criticism for a future situation. Dave? Get in with Kevin Harvick, who earlier said speed good, handling not so good. Uh, where are you at right now? Uh, the speed's really good. The handling's just that far off. Um, just trying to get it through the center of the corner a little bit better. But uh, all in all, Jim Gooden Chevrolet is... It's really fast. We just got to work on the handling just that much. So I think we're all right. And are you motor gurus? Did they say this motor is going to be fine? Just a parts problem with the other one? Yeah, I think it, you know it just had a lot to do with a lot of things lining up just right. And uh, spent some time in the motor shop Monday, and just you know I, everybody feels comfortable with a lot of things. Just made a few little adjustments to a few things, and everything should be fine. Great, thanks, Kevin. Mike. And I think that puts a period on what Jeff Gordon was talking about. Unless you put the speed under the hood in engine. If you if you make it faster, it hurts the driving part of it. And there's a fine line like walking a tightrope. Taylor and Hart Jr. quickest will be right back to practice at Daytona. Valvoline counts it down to the start of the Daytona 500. You can see on NBC and Sunday morning. Don't miss the all new NASCAR race day. Mike, you see that four car there, Scott Wimmer. Remember, we talked about the top 35 and owner that's been locked in coming here to the Daytona 500 from the 2005 season ending points. That team was 36th in owner points, so they missed it by one spot. And he'll have some work to do. Now, remember, this is a race team that actually has three Daytona 500 wins two with Sterling Marlin and one with Ernie Irvin. But Scott Wimmer is going to have to start back in the 18th position to try to race his way into the Daytona 500. Speed wise, I don't think he's going to get there. He's going to have to race his way in. Well, his practice speed is indicative of having a strong chance. He is fifth overall in this session and second fastest among the drivers who have to race their way in to Kevin LePage, who was the Cinderella story of last year's 500. You know, Mike, these practice sheets in drafting, they're, they're, they're feel-good pieces. You know, you're, you're only going to run as fast as the line of cars that you're running with and that you're lined up with. Yeah, Dale Earnhardt Jr. right now is fastest in his practice. I'm sure he's going to be fast once we get in race trim, but sometimes this practice sheet can be a little misleading. And that's the one big thing when you are a crew chief that you want your driver to be able to convey to you. Don't worry about what that practice sheet is telling you. What is that car telling you? Can you hold it wide open? Can you run up to the top? Can you bring it down to the middle? And can you drive that yellow line and be comfortable in that big pack? And that's what you really need to know. And that's what a lot of these guys are doing right now. How comfortable is your race car? Well, prime example, Jeff Gordon's 43rd quickest right now. Yeah. I don't think so. Maybe in his practice, but not as far as his race car. How do we always say it, Larry? Your dance partner makes a big, big difference to how fast you run. The field covered by just about 1.2 seconds right now, and I believe all of the 58 cars that are here have had a chance to practice at least once in this session. Elliot Sadler and Dale Jarrett, the two Robert Yates cars, have logged the most laps in this hour, 29, excuse me, next to uh, Reed Sorensen, who's put 34 laps on the board. 
And as we look out the back of Jimmy Johnson, the 48 car, right there, you see that bright yellow car. That is the third DEI entry of Paul Menard. He's actually in the 15 car, but actually the one car of Mark Truex Jr. is the 15 car. This is a third entry. He's another car that will have to race his way into the 500, and he'll start 17th in that first 150. What Larry's explaining is that since the number one of Martin Truex will run the full season for DEI, DEI applied to NASCAR to move the number 15's owner points to the number one team, and uh, they will have those points to rely on through the season. They're going to run Menard part-time, and he will use uh, the number 15. There he is. Yeah, look at the 07 car right there. That's the same thing that Richard Childress did last year with the 30 number. He turned it in the 07 by applying to NASCAR. We're getting down to just about a minute and a half, two minutes in this practice session. Looks like a lot of the teams, uh, their practice laps uh, has got up into the 20s. I do see, we talked about Reed Sorensen a while ago in the 41 car. Remember, seat time, seat time. He's ran 35 laps in this practice, which appears to about be the most of anyone. Kyle Busch has logged only nine laps. Jeff Gordon, nine laps. The Gordon is on track right now. And among the regulars, the series regulars, those are the least amount of laps run. And I think Jeff Gordon you know, kind of gave us an idea early on that he didn't feel like he needed to get too much practice going on here because he feels like the 150 will be a good tune-up for the, for the 500. He knows what he wants to drive this racetrack and what makes him feel comfortable in his race car. So he doesn't need to run a ton of laps to be able to get to that point where he's happy with his race car. I look at Michael Waltrip there in the 55 car. I think this car is going to be a lot like Dale Earnhardt Jr. It just couldn't cut that fast lap in qualified. He's going to start back in the 23rd position in the second dual race. We're riding with him here now. But based on his performance, obviously with a different car in the Budweiser shootout, I believe that car will be a contender. It's going to be very competitive tomorrow and on Thursday. But this is the 77 car from last year. We've been talking about this number swap. So this is a team that is locked into the Daytona 500. Waltrip running a Dodge out of Bill Davis Racing shops and taking sponsor Napa with him. 66, a new look this year for the former Zero car. Jeff Green driving for Haas Racing in the Best Buy Chevy. The red and black flags together indicate that this hour of practice is over and has been won by Dale Earnhardt Jr. The fastest to do 22 laps. 47.02 seconds. What was that sound? That was about 58 crew chiefs going, ah, it's over. We'll be back to wrap up this hour of Nextel Cup practice for the Daytona 500. Speed Channel welcomes you back to the home track of Alan Gustafson, the crew chief of young Kyle Busch, who in the Daytona International Speedway's new garages, signing some autographs. That's a neat little trap door where the fans can come up and get your autograph. It is. It was a pretty good and uh, innovative idea by the Daytona International Speedway. So the whole fan zone and what it's all about, you know, it's a pretty cool idea. But uh, we're out here in Allen Gustafson's home state, Florida, at his home How track. How is his car doing? His car's doing pretty good. This one's a heck of a lot better. You know, I really enjoy racing with these guys and doing what we do with the Kellogg Chevrolet. And, you know, this one's uh, pretty sporty. We went from the back to the front in like two laps, so I was pretty impressed with this one. To Dave. With Jamie McMurray. And I examined the front of your car, noticed there wasn't a lot of evidence of slam drafting there. Were you consciously trying to learn how to go fast without hitting guys out there? Yeah, I mean, in practice, you typically don't do that anyway. Um, it seems like that happens when there's five laps to go in a race more so than anything because you just get so anxious. But, um, you know, today didn't really, I didn't hit anybody today. Just try to see, uh, make your car handle and, and make it suck up. It's just, uh, it's always a challenge when you come here. And it's it's so hot today that uh, there's not a lot of grip. Scale of 1 to 10, how far did you get? How what? How far did you get on making it suck up and go fast? And we didn't gain much the first practice. So we're going to go back and, and put some stuff that we ran in our shootout car because we felt like it, it drove really well. and. And it sucked up great, so see what we can do. Great. Thanks, Jamie. Mike? Thanks, Dave. Two tense moments during practice. The first for, for uh, Denny Hamlin. 
Yeah, the number 11 car right here. Winner the other night of the Budweiser shootout. He gets up the outside wall, loses control of the nose. But later on, Larry Mack, it got a little bit interesting in three and four. But I tell you, I was pretty impressed with Kyle Petty's interview. You know, he was not upset. He gave constructive criticism to rookie Reed Soren and said, look, this is practice. But if I'm Paul Andrews, Kyle Petty's crew chief, I'm pretty much saying, isn't our car driving pretty good? I think a good, safe place for this next practice would be right here in the garage area. That was Kenny Wallace he made contact with, but it was Sorensen who raced on through. Otherwise, nice, safe hour. It was. No bump drafting. No, no bump slam drafting. drafting. Yep. Nobody's and mad. We'll do it again in one hour right here on Speed.